Good afternoon. How was lunch? Great. <laughs> the lunch was so good. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ramaya Krishnan. I'm uh, the dean of the uh, Heinz College of Information uh, Systems and Public Policy. Uh, and we're delighted to be here, and thanks to Sarah for uh, organizing, uh, along with the Atlantic Council, this workshop. Um, it's, it's been a, a really great start, um, and we had this wonderful panel um, before lunch uh, on misinformation, disinformation, and technology and foreign interference in elections. Uh, this panel, um, and I'm joined by three outstanding panelists here, Laura Galante, uh, Chris Painter, and my colleague Ronnie Rosenfeld uh, from CMU. Uh, this panel is about um, technology uh, and foreign interference uh, in life. Now, uh, we won't take the philosophical view of what is life, um, but um, I, I, I thought, you know, uh, as, um, so Carnegie Mellon as a university is very focused on this nexus of technology and society, and the Heinz College is a center of excellence at this, uh, on problems that live at this nexus of people, uh, public policy, and technology. And as I think about, um, you know, a class of systems that I'll call social cyber physical systems, and each of these phrases I think are, are, are relevant, um, if broadly familiar with cyber physical systems are systems that have been now widely deployed um, in, in the world today that involve both uh, digital components to them, but physical components to them as well. Um, so for instance, the, the electricity grid is an example. Um, the ways in which uh, the, the internet and um, critical infrastructure of various sorts, transportation, healthcare, financial services, all of these are examples of cyber physical systems. And they're social cyber physical systems because people either inhabit them or are greatly affected by how resilient and how well performing uh, they are. And the focus of this panel is really uh, going to be about um, technology underlying these systems and the manner in which uh, they could be affected or exploited um, uh, and uh, therefore have consequences on individual citizens and on society. Now, very quickly, um, you know, if I, if I think of um, three examples to give you, I mean, uh, and my colleagues here on the panel are gonna expand on this. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, the WannaCry uh, virus and the impact it had on, on hospital systems um, by um, preventing the use of electronic health record systems by physicians and the Im impact that had on delivery of care. Uh, if I think about uh, the movie that many of you may not have seen, Guardians of Peace, uh, this is about, you know, uh, the movie about the Sony Pictures made about... The interview. The interview, sorry, the interview, the interview, <laughs> sorry, the interview. They really didn't see that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is about Kim Jong-un. Um, and there were all sorts of attacks on um, um, uh, Sony Pictures um, through malware and emails um, th that were released uh, by uh, executives at the, uh, at the, um, at the studio. Um, and then you have uh, attacks on the energy grid that have brought down uh, utilities um, and left uh, individuals without power. So you have all these examples of cyber physical systems um, in use and how their um, attacks on them and, they, and their lack of resiliency has led to impacts on everyday life. So the, this panel, I'd love for this panel to not only have my panelists speak to this issue, but really to have a conversation with all of you and hopefully we'll be able to get to um, a point where we can talk about solutions and, op and options both in terms of the problem that we are trying to address the solutions that are potentially on the table, both in terms of getting organizations that are involved in critical infrastructure provision to harden and make their infrastructure more resilient, and at the same time, what options are available if you're able to identify actors who are uh, trying to affect these systems. So that's what's on tap. I think it's going to be truly exciting. So I'm going to uh, begin by asking Laura to kick things off. And um, Laura, take it off. Great, thank you. So 
I'm looking forward to getting to, to the discussion that we've been wanting to have all day from, from what Ambassador Mendelssohn laid out of getting to a response on what are some pretty complex problems here. And what I've been asked to do is kind of do some table setting around the incidents over the last four or five years here um, that have shown that crossover from the cyber to the physical world to the kinetic space um, that the professor is speaking about. So I'm going to start, at, you, re you referenced the Sony attack. Um, I was working at the company that did the investigation at the time back in 2014 and with the Sony incident just as a quick recap to get everyone on on the same page for the next couple incidents this is widely seen as um, one of the attacks that's happened that showed how deeply malware could really affect the operations of a company and to such a degree that Sony was taken offline for a period of time um, to make it more vivid not only could you not work if you were a Sony employee but you couldn't even buy Buy your food at the cafeteria without them pulling out the old credit card ch -ch 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 machines that traced your credit card for you, right? So Sony was truly taken down to its knees by North Korean hackers um, who saw this as a way, saw the attack on Sony as a way um, to prevent the interview, this uh, awful <laughs> movie, um, this, this parody of the death of, um, of, of the leader of North Korea at the time. And this, um, th this was seen as so, um, at the time, really seen as almost out of the blue that a motion picture company is getting attacked there in 2014 um, for, for what was considered here art, right? Or some form of art, at least. And Sony executives had been um, you know, warned for months and months and months by the threat actors, by the hackers themselves, that this would be the consequence of releasing this movie. So this is, um, I, I think, in a lot of ways, a convergence of, of a lot of the topics we're getting at here and picking up a little bit on the combination of the soft psychological kind of info war space and how that played out with an actual technical use of malware and, and wiping of the hard drives and, and the effect that it had on Sony's systems um, and that this was a corporation having to deal uh, with a foreign actor, in this case, North Korea. Um, so a lot of different lines here to explore. And, and the government response is, uh, is something that I'll, I'll leave to Chris to kind of pick up on if, if needed um, around Sony. The next set of attacks that I will point out um, here is as good examples that crossed into this cyber um, physical line, if you will, are what are referred to as the black energy attacks in 2015 and 2016 in Europe. Ukraine. And it's no surprise that Ukraine has been um, something of a training ground for years for what foreign influence operations um, have looked like and, and what the Russian government has been interested in perpetrating, particularly with regard to the Russian military's hacker groups. Um, Several of the groups that are seen to be under the GRU, Russian Military Intelligence, APT-28, um, and then a group called Sandworm have been most frequently involved in these attacks. With Black Energy, Sandworm um, is seen to be the group behind this. What happened is Christmas Eve 2015, actually the 23rd, December 23rd, right before Christmas in Ukraine, um, a distribution system, several distribution, di distribution systems are taken down um, throughout the country, particularly in Western Ukraine. And uh, of note is that the way that the circuits at the distribution, at the power stations, at the distribution stations were taken down is through a remote computer that had the command and control circuit breakers um, cloned onto it. So in some cases, they weren't even just having to remotely access and change the circuits, but weeks and weeks of planning had gone into the operation that the Russian military was behind um, in 2015. Now, in, in 2016, transmission stations were taken down. So you're sort of moving up the arteries of, of, uh, of, of power plants, right? Distributions are lowest. You're going up to transmission stations by 2016. Um, Negro and, and other companies are compromised. And um, in this case... Uh, Ukraine in, in power is taken down for about an hour, so shorter. And in a lot of ways, the way that uh, these companies were allowed to get back, were able to get back online, wasn't simply just going back and turning systems back on. It was manually going out to the power station and flipping the circuit breakers back on. 
in Ukraine, you have a lot more experience with those manual backups than a lot of other places. So uh, I, that's actually something I think that's worth taking into consideration as we as we truly think of how granular response is going to, to need to be in, in some of these cases. Um, so I see those those energy attacks as, as one of our first real um, examples of where we crossed the line into um, into the physical space. And, uh, and Sony is, is yet another where um, that kind of early precursor of crossing these lines began. So I'll stop there. I'll leave not Petia for Chris and, and some other um, incidents that I think are real noteworthy, but that's a starting point. Thank you, Laura. Chris. Uh, thanks, and thanks, Laura. Um, so we've seen a number of these incidents, right? And one of the other big ones that happened was what was called the not Petia worm. And as you may recall, uh, that one had widespread financial effects, including uh, essentially knocking uh, Maersk, the giant shipping company, uh, completely out of its game, uh, making it impossible really to ship things around the world. But, so that caused untold amounts of financial damage. Fortunately, no deaths. And you know, this is one of the things we haven't seen yet. Despite all the pundits talking about cyber war, we really haven't had a cyber war. It doesn't mean we won't have one, but it certainly uh, means that we're having very serious contents affecting our everyday lives. I should say, just as an introduction, you know, um, uh, about that movie, I when I I was the first cyber diplomat in, in, in the world, actually, I guess, in the, in the State Department in 2011. And I tried to make my office unique by having movie posters where hackers or computers were the main characters. And I had about 30 of them. There's about 70 I have overall. Uh, one was the interview, although that didn't really count. It was really one of the worst movies. They're all pretty dystopian movies. I don't think there's any really uplifting movies you can find here. The other is just to the theme of this gathering today, uh, I do think it's important, and I'll, I'll talk about this more, to have that connection between the technical community and the policy community, which is often missing. Indeed, at the State Department, one of the first people I hired was a senior technical advisor, a retired Motorola vice president who worked on creating the actual cell phone at one point. But we need that. You don't need policymakers to understand things. It, they don't have to code, but they have to understand what the trade space is, and, and we're just not there yet. Um, so not petty had this effect. We had a number of these things. And then the question is, what are we doing about them? Um, and there's the short game and the long game. There's what we do to protect ourselves, what kind of resilience we have in place, how do we, quote unquote, harden the targets. Frankly, we have, despite thinking about this for 20 years, we're not that far in this. We're still incredibly vulnerable. We don't have good cyber hygiene. Uh, my former colleague, Jane Luth, the deputy secretary, former deputy secretary of DHS, talks about this frequently, that if you just do basic cyber hygiene, we can escape a vast majority of these attacks. Now, the sophisticated actors will still be able to get in, obviously, often, but you get rid of a lot of the other noise in the system. So we see these things happening again and again, and we're not treating it enough as a major national or international issue or priority. And so as we think about it, one is hardening the targets. Another one is creating some rules in the road. There's a lot of people who think, well, there, cyberspace is this lawless space. There are no rules in cyberspace. Um, and there's been a lot of activity around this, and this is more the long-term game. How do you uh, achieve stability in cyberspace in the coming years and decades? So one effort has been in the UN where they've agreed on a group of norms, rules of the road, voluntary to be sure, but still, I think, important, of things you shouldn't do when you're not at war. Don't attack the critical infrastructure of another country. Don't attack the certs, the, the, you know, the C certs, the, they're like the ambulances or hospitals on the internet. And even Russia and China and others have agreed that. Doesn't they, they mean they necessarily will comply with that, but at least they agreed, and that creates this level of accountability. Don't steal the intellectual property of another country to um, benefit your commercial sector. So these are important to have some idea of what the rules are, and that's really important. Um, there was um, a commission I was on, which we issued our report two weeks ago, in Paris, uh, this is a global commission on the stability of cyberspace. I recommend folks look at this. We came up with a number of additional proposed norms, including countries should have vulnerability equities processes, so they make sure that there's a default to disclosing vulnerabilities, that, uh, that the global core of the internet should be off limits. You shouldn't attack that because that can cause all kinds of problems for everyone and a number of others. It talks about a number of other recommendations. Uh, and I think those are important. Uh, but all the, rules in the, uh, the, all the rules in the world are not going to help you if there are no consequences for the people who break those rules. And unfortunately, we've been terrible, terrible, not just the U.S., but around the world in imposing accountability and consequences on the bad, bad actors who do this. Um, and I, that's one of the recommendations we make in here. But we still really have to get our act together in that way. 
We've also been terrible even communicating these to the, the, the communities we're trying to serve. So again, under the theme of this conference, a couple of years ago, I gave a, um, a keynote speech to the annual FIRST conference. This is the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams. These are all the national and, and, uh, and company certs who come together. Uh, and this was after the UN had come up with this, this rule, this voluntary rule. I mentioned it, and a lot of people came up, and no one there knew about it. So we hadn't even told the community. The government had nationally formed the community, and they could have helped inform how we think about that and how we implement it. So we got a lot more work to do in that space. But this idea of accountability is one that I wanted to touch on because I think um, we've had some efforts, and we mentioned a couple of them, on attribution. In the Sony attack, President Obama was the first person ever uh, at a high level uh, to say a nation state has done this. And that was a big deal. And I remember calling 20 of my counterparts around the world and said, he's going to do this. We hope you get your support. Um, you know, we need to have better collective action. We've had more collective action more recently on both the NotPetya and the WannaCry that was North Korea and Russia, um, Russia for NotPetya, and um, Russia for NotPetya and, um, and North Korea for WannaCry. <laughs> We've had collective attribution, number of countries coming together and say it's them. But we, what we've been bad at doing, and this is true for Russian interference in our election too, actually imposing consequences that are going to make the actor change their mind uh, to deter their actor in the future. We haven't done things, and they're not just cyber tools. They're economic tools. They're diplomatic tools. They're the full range of tools we can bring to bear, not just alone, but in collection with other countries. Again, collective action. We've not done that well. And so rules then end up just being words on paper if there's no way to have accountability to call people out, but then also have consequences that follow from that. Uh, in NotPetya, six and a half months after the event, uh, the US, Australia, the UK, and a couple others, Estonia and a couple others came out at the Munich Security Conference and said, it's Russia. And they said this and they said, and there will be consequences. It's six and a half months later. <laughs> you know, it's not really timely. And that threat is not really very strong. Wait seven months and have some consequence you're going to announce. I think we need to be much more strategic and strong on the way we do this, and we just haven't been. Um, so as we think of the way ahead, we have, to, we have to be careful. We don't want to be escalatory. We, want, we don't want to cause problems. We don't want to make it uh, so it gets worse by taking action. But if we do it collectively and we actually are good at, at communicating with the potential adversaries what we're doing, I think that can make us all uh, safer in the long term. And I'll stop there. Lots of other things to say, but I'll hold them off for now. Chris, thank you. I, I mean, you, you raised a number of really interesting issues about resilience and norms. And, and Carnegie Mellon is home to the lead um, CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team at the Software Engineering Institute. So we certainly want the, yeah, the first. And we certainly want it to be right. off limits. <laughs> so, uh, Ronnie. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to step off temporarily off the cyber physical um, question, mostly because I don't have much to say about it, uh, and also because I took a different interpretation to the question to the title of, of this panel, uh, which is the everyday impact of interference, and specifically the information manipulation, how it's viewed from an individual's perspective. And the image that comes to my mind is going back 100, 120 years to the early days of mass consumer market in the US. And if you looked at the labels of uh, packaged food, which was just a new thing then, uh, or uh, drugs, uh, you would see incredible claims on them, right? And we've come a long way since then. I mean, the claims were that they would cure everything from cancer to shingles to what have you. And we've come a long way along two processes. One of them was a legislative, maybe regulatory process. There was an FDA and there were rules about what you can or cannot say. And there were specific requirements of putting in nutritional labels. That's necessary, but not sufficient. The second part, where we were somewhat less su successful, is in educating the public to look at these labels and understand them and act on them. And I think we're now in the sort of information superhighway, in, especially in social media, at the Wild West stage, where anything goes and everything goes and nobody knows how to interpret it. What I think we need to do is to embark on these two processes. One is put together infrastructure for allowing informed people to track the source of information, verifiable authors, and the technology for this exists. We, there, you, you're all familiar with Facebook having verified user or, or um, uh, sort of um, 
recommendation systems, having verified people. You can create verified persons, individuals, and verified organizations. The more important thing is, what do you do with uh, free speech? So the answer is, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting we restrict free speech. I'm not even suggesting we restrict anonymous free speech. I'm only suggesting we label anonymous free speech and label it clearly. So I think this is currently missing in modern browser technology. It is not easy to know who said what. In fact, it's not easy to know where a page came from. People who have slight sophistication know to look at the URL and to look at the label of the URL. Many people don't know that, right? This is a failure of human interface design. We need to make the, um, the verification and authenticity paramount in our interfaces so that people have access to this information, can trace back the source of different claims. We can use blockchain technology to verify who said what. If somebody said something for the record, they put it in blockchain, you can verify this is exactly what they said and it wasn't uh, altered. Um, you can use um, uh, authentication information to trace information to brands, to informational brands. So the idea is, we're not going to have an FDA, we're not going to have a government agency that, that is the, the um, arbiter of what's right and wrong, because this is politics, and there is no one arbiter. We're not going to trust the government or the opposition, but there will be multiple brands. Well, Fox News is going to be one of them. Some people trust Fox News more than NPR. Well, fine, let something be verified to the standards of Fox News. Let other things be verified to the standards of NPR and let the informed population decide who they're going to trust. The important thing is when they see a story, they should know whose standards is it verified to, whose standards is it, is it uh, um, tested and all the sources verified and so forth. So we can create a network of verification, authentication and endorsements that is completely missing today. People can continue to put on anonymous information but perhaps it should have a nice little red frame around it so that people know this is anonymous. This, there's no way of tracing who did that. So all this infrastructure is completely missing. And we need to start putting it into our communication, into our browsing, and the second part is into our educational system. So we need to teach informational resilience. And by this, I don't mean information resilience. I don't mean the resilience of information. I mean the resilience to information. We need to bring our population to a level of sophistication where they can understand attribution, um, verification, brand trusting, and so forth. I think this is an important thing to start in K through eight, just you know, arguably as important or more important than math. This has to be part of an educated populace. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Ronnie. So, so we have two a two-layered stack in this discussion. So one layer relates to the uh, underlying architecture and technology of cyber physical systems. Um, and Laura and Chris sort of laid out a set of issues related to how to make the existing infrastructure resilient uh, and um, what the consequences are, um, both to ensuring resilience uh, as well as if there were attacks, how do you ensure responses? And then Ronnie talked about the content infrastructure layer that rides on top of these systems, how do you sort of ensure um, the consumers of information are made resilient to uh, potential manipulation of information? So there are these two uh, sets of topics. One idea, and I'm going to turn this over to all of you, and if you could you know, put your cards up, if you have comments, and we'd love to have a conversation with all of you, is um, if you think about banks, now they're regulated entities, uh, the government has stress testing of banks, right? So uh, post the financial crisis, um, the idea of stress testing uh, was the idea that you had the appropriate uh, wherewithal to withstand a crisis. Um, is, th is this an appropriate time when you think about resiliency um, to require um, the utility providers, the companies that actually take part in, in the critical infrastructures, uh, or the organizations that provide critical services to actually be stress tested in some ways. Is, does that make sense? Um, there are standards associated with vendors and the products that they provide. Um, should there be certification of those kinds of standards and the requirement for the deployment of those to ensure hardening? And then there are a number of ideas related to 
responses that we could have a conversation with you about and uh, what Chris calls the trade space. If you attack us this way, then if that's attributable, then you get to suffer some consequences by being kicked off some um, very useful economic kind of uh, network like the SWIFT network. Anyway, so a number of really interesting uh, set of ideas to pursue. So why don't we uh, ha begin the discussion? Uh, so please uh, put your card up and I can call on you to uh, contribute to the discussion. Um, who wants to go first? I think we're back there. Uh, first, I, I can't read your name quite <laughs> fully. I'm sorry. It's somewhat occluded, but um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the thing I can't understand is uh, how you can really attack a power grid because they're on a private network. I mean, it's very easy to get on the internet, which is a common network, but it's like the Stutnik virus. The uh, Iran centrifuges that were attacked, the virus was put on a memory stick and someone physically put it on a computer. So you have a private network. So unless it's sabotage, how can you, from a remote computer, get on a private network and therefore disable, say, the power grid? How, how does that happen? So um, let me uh, request, um, say, Chris to speak to it. but. There's both the aspect of connections via um, the um, corporate networks, but then there's also called what's called bridging the air gap. But uh, do you want to speak to it? Or actually, I think you were yeah, I'm it, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, in the in the case of black in the case of black energy, they were um, the systems that the power plant, the substation, and the transmission system were on were connected to the internet. So there, in a lot of cases, there are portions of the operating systems within the operational operating systems within power plants that are offline, but there's still basic connectivity to different parts of the plant. And um, I, I don't recall the exact way that the tunneling worked in the 2015 attack, but the way that these worked is they were able to do reconnaissance inside the network and understand what programs controlled the circuit breakers. And uh, w when the reporting came out about this, there's a very vivid video that someone took with their iPhone, one of the operators took with their iPhone, where they see the cursor, the little arrow of the mouse, um, going over to the circuit breaker and clicking them open remotely from the desktop that they have uh, connected to the network inside the, the actual transmission station. So this is completely remote. Um, there, there is not a uh, suspicion that there was an insider who had planted something, at least in the case of these black energy um, attacks. And, and what this does speak to is it, it gets back to this resilience question to some degree, which is what really does need to be online, especially in the in critical infrastructure space. But in this case, they had a, a connection online. Well, that was only in the Ukraine. That wouldn't apply. They just made a big error in the way they designed the system. If a properly designed system, which is separated from the internet, would be very difficult to attack. Is not that true? Well, if it's not online, there it is harder to attack. I mean, that's yes, the nature of the game. Now, there, what I wouldn't want to um, conclude is that. Ukraine was somehow behind, and because they were sitting there connected to the internet with some of their operational systems, that this wouldn't happen in the US. We have seen black energy in um, just what, earlier this spring? Um, the US government said that black energy, the this, this same malware, has been on um, US utilities in, in power plants, so was detected on it. So um, I in fact, there's more connectivity at a lot of US utilities than there, than there is in Ukraine, given um, how quickly technology was adopted at some of the, the plants here. Yeah, I, I just echo that. I'd say uh, you're right, and this is one of the enduring problems. If something is configured absolutely perfectly and people take all the precautions and it's completely not connected to the internet, it's much safer. It's not completely safe because there's insider and other threats that are there. People don't do that, though. You know, it'd be nice if everyone did that. This is one of the reasons that these attacks succeed again and again. People don't even do the basic hygiene steps they need to. So you can't assume that level of protection that's there, and you can't assume that uniformity. 
just a quick word on the Ukrainian attack. The original attack began with a sphere, f a sphere phishing attack on an individual computer that then spread into the network. Uh, but your point actually about heterogeneity and the benefits that accrue from heterogeneity in architecture and disconnection from the public internet is actually uh, a defense of the sort that uh, I think you were alluding to. It used to be. I mean, I think it used to be that power plant software was such a, you know, unique and, and kind of backwater area that, and there was, you know, no one would hack into it because no one really understood the code. But now many of them are running on like Windows 10. So that, that changes it. Did you have a question here? Did you have a, a, a um, you had it up and then you put it down. Yeah, I know, so. I was feeling shy. Um, the, there, there was a, a, a mention, I, I particularly like the bank metaphor, I thought that was, that was very useful. Um, and there have been times when the internet has been, well, when social media companies or search companies have been able to deter bad behavior by cutting off payment access, such as when uh, people were finding your mugshot, putting up at the top of the search results, charging you $200 to take it down, and then just put it back up again a week later under another company. So it's this sort of ransomware. Do you see any, particularly a question uh, from Mr. Rosenfeld, do you, do you see any opportunities for a kind of uh, a, a, another level of control that could be uh, financial? Just <coughs> throwing it out there. Um, I would think so. Um, I, I think if you ask yourself what separates the good guys from the bad guys, is that the good guys can operate in public and they tend to be yeah. operate in public and tend to be a majority. So any technique that relies on that is likely to, to be sort of give it a differential advantage. And I think financial, uh, like the SWIFT network, the SWIFT uh, penalty that was discussed here is quite severe. And I would imagine that we might need to build a whole set of gradations, uh, how much you, you use that, but all the way up to and through um, SWIFT and, and, uh, and uh, sanctions beyond that. But yeah, I think uh, finance, financial tools have uh, traditionally been shown to be very effective in um, uh, dealing with um, difficult problems that are difficult to deal with otherwise, such as uh, hate groups and um, uh, sort of internal uh, domestic uh, players. Uh, I, I would be a fan of that. And I'm not speaking from a position of, uh, of uh, expertise, but. Um. Yeah, I mean, that's worked well for like child pornography and other things like that. It's, it's harder to do in this area because sanctions work sometimes because it denies the, the bad criminals if you can identify them or nation states the use of the U.S. financial system, which has far broader context, as Dan Fried can tell you, than just in the U.S. So that, that is one aspect. You know, when we're thinking of these creative tools, though, I mean, obviously, when you think about it, and this is why I require thought, the SWIFT thing does have problems. Um, you get to use it once, probably, and that's it, because the countries you do it will then develop their own payment systems, as they already are doing, to become more independent. Um, the private sector runs SWIFT, not governments, so you know that, that means the governments can't really do it on their own. And it has huge economic consequences on us, so you have to decide how this is done. The other one that I threw out in terms of black holing traffic, you know, uh, the technical community has done this for years. On bat, when they see bad traffic coming in, they black hole, what they call black hole. They uh, prevent, I'll simplify this, prevent certain IP addresses from having access to your routing to the US. In other words, they, the bad stuff can't get here. Now the problem is how exquisitely can you do that, narrow that, so you don't cut off good stuff from coming here? Do you not block news organizations or other things? And do you block the entire country of Russia? No, that would be hard. You know, that would be a huge issue for the Russian people. So how do you then be, do that more narrowly, and of course, smart, you know, nation states or cyber criminals will will you change their tactics and procedures to get around them. So, so this is why I think this is not just us throwing out ideas. This is where I really do think the technical community and the policy community need to roll up their sleeves and think of what are the options that are out there that we just haven't thought of. So, there's a question back there. You also put your card down. Um, <laughs> yes, um, it's it, my <clears throat> information's a little out of date. Back in the early Obama administration, I know the NSA wanted to make almost a legal requirement for banks and other organizations to report any s attempt of cyber attack on their system. I know the banking industry 
didn't want to go that direction. And I think even the utilities and CSX and others were a little lukewarm. Now, I don't know if they have come around more to an accepting position on that or not. So, so I'd say we, we have slavishly followed this idea that incentives will cure everything, right? And they haven't. Uh, incentives are important as part of the measure. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's clear that for a lot of these industries, these critical infrastructures, uh, they haven't done enough yet. And we need, to, we need to figure out new ways to either incentivize or push them to do this. Uh, now, with the banking industry, they are regulated industries. So uh, uh, the regulators have made it important for them to report these issues. Now, they've been a little... They need to be a little more definite, substantial effect, and you know, even big cybercrime cases might not have a substantial effect on a, a huge multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar company. But, but I think it's gotten a little better. SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, has disclosure requirements. That probably needs to get stronger. The European Union has done work. You talked about certification. Mm -hmm. They have a new uh, Cybersecurity Act in the EU which requires voluntary certification, which, you know, as what happened with uh, what they call the GDPR, the Globe, the Digital Privacy nice, Act, yeah. will end up becoming a global standard whether the U.S. wants it to or not. And so, so I think there has been some aspect, but there are a lot of critical infrastructures that don't have that regulatory framework where they're not maybe as in tune to this as they need to be. Um, you know, we've talked, I'm a, I'm a recovering lawyer. We've talked about, uh, uh, you know, lawyers are litigious people. Um, and we talked about liability for these things for years and years and years, but there's no set standard of care. There's no, there really is no liability. There's no real, uh, in my view, effective insurance regime that's driven by liability. There is some insurance out there. I think things like what they call the NIST standards, and uh, this is developed by the Department of Commerce, as voluntary standards, over time that will be a standard of care and that we'll see some of this, but we need, I think, a little stronger hand in this, in my view. Laura, did you want to comment? Yeah, um, I, I, I'll pick up a little bit on, on your insurance point. I think that there are drivers, quite a few outside of government right now, who are imposing at least some level of cost or maybe thought, um, even prematurely of cost, for, for a lot of corporations that, that I've been dealing with um, over the last few years. And on the insurance point, I think whether, um, you know, whether government fills the, the hole and in, in, in thinks through what the regulatory framework work looks like for um, for companies' networks or whether it's insurance policies, I think increasingly there's going to need to be a, a um, you know, set equivalent to what the physical, um, you know, equivalent of, of, of digital locks on your door would be for companies, and that will be either dictated through insurance policies or incented through types of insurance policies. Um, but at this point, being able to insure against the types of risks uh, that we're seeing in cyberspace Space, whether it's you know Maersk having their their company taken down and what 16 of 76 shipping terminals in the world down for days I mean these are huge corporate costs and if if government's not going to come in with the level of granularity around security uh, regulations that are needed then other places like insurance policies will start filling those gaps so just a word on insurance as well so at, at, at Carnegie Mellon we have a a fairly significant effort with both information security officers as well as risk officers. These are programs that we run. Um, and in, as part of this discussion, we've had a number of really interesting conversations with insurance companies around just the issues that Laura and Chris just talked about. Um, firms don't have, uh, and nor do insurance companies have, a good equivalent of the, uh, or the, of the mortality table, so to speak, uh, in this space, and they don't know how to price this risk. Um, and um, so on the other hand, many of these firms feel the need for some kind of insurance. Uh, so I think this idea of having to internalize the costs um, associated with these, because there are externalities associated with this, this might not just be this organization that is affected, but they, it might actually spread across multiple organizations. Therefore, the need for um, some kind of stress testing of the sort that we, uh, that we are seeing in other sectors so that the, the aspect of how to insure against these kinds of risks, which in turn will provide the right incentives to invest in the infrastructure to provide resilience, I think is an interesting idea. I just wanted to put stomp that. I mean, I think the problem is when you don't know what the damages are, you don't know because the liability is not out there, and it's hard to quantify. That's one of the problems with insurance out there. I think um, there's been some cases where 
insurance companies are underwriting uh, some of this stuff, but based more on what the companies are doing to protect themselves rather than what the loss is. There have been some high profile claims recently of an insurance company denying coverage for the big Notpedia worm saying it was an act of war. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty here, uh, right. but we, but you know, you need a, you need a, you need a system that is more like what we have in physical world threats uh, than we have now with cyber. And reinsurance is a big issue for those kinds of insurance uh, um, as well. Okay, so a lot of questions on this side. Perhaps this side needs to ask some questions. Uh, any questions on this side? Or comments? Or comments? Yeah. This is what I used to do in class, so you're giving me an opportunity to do this over and over again. So. <laughs> I'll come to you in just a minute. So can I just offer a quick comment on this? The, the, the question was, are there standards, IEEE, ISO, et cetera? Um, so um, DARPA has been leading a very significant effort, um, and NIST has some uh, standards in this space as well, in particular related to uh, what I was talking about, uh, these um, high assurance SCADA systems. Uh, these are these control and data acquisition systems that are widely deployed in critical infrastructure. Um, so DARPA has got uh, a very significant effort that's been ongoing now for close to eight, nine years. Um, they also did a recent uh, DOE, uh, DOD, uh, and uh, DHS effort um, simulating a cyber attack in Plum Island to see what the response would be to um, taking down um, uh, utility and seeing how quickly can you bring the grid back up. So there have been these kinds of efforts uh, ongoing. Um, but the issue of are there particular standards that vendors have to sell to or meet, I'm not as knowledgeable about that. Uh, Chris? I'd, I'd say generally no. There's pockets of like really regulated industries or, or areas like the healthcare industry where there are uh, some firm standards. I think often people are, are worried about go, calling something a standard because then that means it's required and that means then there's liability if you don't meet it and that's regulatory and people, the R word is a bad word just generally in DC for, you know, and, and unfortunately I think we have to like rethink that to some extent. I'm not saying the regulatory approach is the right way, but I think we have to rethink how we're, how we're doing this. Um, there are some good things out there. You mentioned the NIST, the NIST framework, the framework, it's not standards, it's the framework. Um, but it was built by the critical infrastructure with, uh, uh, with, um, uh, with the help of the government. So it's, it's a joint project, and I think that's been helpful. And that could ripen into a standard over time, as I said before. Uh, I mentioned the stuff that's going on in Europe. The idea of something called ANISA, the European Network in Information uh, Security. Uh, Security Agency, uh, which is in Greece, oddly, uh, will, um, is supposed to help implement these certification regimes, again, working with the various industries. So that'll be an interesting project as it goes forward. There are other things that are, that are you mentioned IEEE. Yes, they have more technical standards that are out there. Uh, uh, there's a number of those out there that NIST has as well. Uh, there's, I'm on the board of a company, a nonprofit called the Center for Internet Security, works closely with DHS in running the election interference or the election ISAC, information sharing and analysis uh, group, and also the multi-state one. Uh, but also has something called tw the 20 CIS controls, and if you and there, you have sub controls under this. If you do, if you're a business and you follow all those controls, you're probably protected against 90% of the stuff that's out there. Uh, not the you know, very sophisticated nation states will still find a way in, but this is a, a big deal. But people aren't really following that because they don't have to. Some are, some aren't, and insurance companies others are using that somewhat as an underwriting standard. So. So I'd say it's episodic at best, and that's probably part of the problem. Is that there's no real firm standard out there that people, even if they want to do it, uh, can look to and say that's what we should be doing. Ronnie, did you have a comment? Uh, no, no, okay. Thank you. Up here. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a question more uh, focused on misinformation. Uh, sure. It's very obvious that a power grid or you know, having to take down a movie or cyber attacks something that people can feel, can see, and you know, they may know where it comes from or not. But with this information, we have a bigger problem, which is people don't even allow it to exist. So it's like the debate about this information is so politicized that people deny it. I mean, even people in government, even the president denies it. <laughs> and 
sometimes I, I mean I do most of my research on this information and when you address um, a group of citizens, journalists, uh, diplomats, whatever, there's always someone who's like, no, this, I mean, uh, you know, like, yeah, you're saying that maybe Russia or Iran, which I research in Spanish and they do it in Spanish, but the United States does it too. And, you know, the European Union does it too. So I wanted to know what are your ideas on making this problem of hybrid warfare, this information um, more transparent, like to make people acknowledge it, or I don't know, you talked about education, it's very important, but I think we're not doing enough there, or like society's not doing enough, and it's a bigger problem, even like Spanish, what we're seeing in Latin America right now is extremely worrisome. Um, we see Russian, and not only Russian, also from Iran, by the way, I don't know why Iran has like Spanish disinformation. <laughs> uh, and we see like they are preying on the problems that the continent is having right now to spread disinformation on accounts that Twitter consistently takes down. They are based in Iran, Venezuela, or Russia, spreading disinformation in Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, um, anywhere. Today, I, I was in another conference at the Mexican North American State. We were addressing the same topic, and two journalists from Colombia were like, No, that's a lie. That's the United States is also doing that. You know, like, mm. And it's not, because you know, clearly the, the headlines and RT is taking the show. I just want to know your ideas on like, how we can actually make the people better informed about this. Take a look at this. <laughs> No real ideas, but just trying to point out that um, information manipulation has been around forever, right? And it is as effective as the differential between the sophistication of the perpetrator and the lack of sophistication of the receiver. So it stands to reason that the more you are able to raise the level of sophistication of the receiver, uh, the, the, the more you reduce the risk and the impact of it. So this is just another way of saying education is, is really important. But there is a, an in-between factor. Um, take web browsing, which became prevalent in the last 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the technology actually existed well before. What was missing was the user interface. It was the Netscape communicator that came out in the late 90s, I think, that made it extremely easy. It was the, is, it was the act of clicking on something and going there that caused the web to penetrate every household as opposed to being just a, a, a purview of, of academics and computer science geeks, right? So something very similar can happen in information consumption, or information, what I call informational resilience. <coughs> uh, it's not just that you want to educate people, you want to give them tools that are, that nudge them towards the more intelligent and critical use of information. Right now, I'm going back to my previous point, right now the tools we give them, which are browsers, are terrible in that regard. They are not built to help people discern veracity of information, source of information. Um, we need to change the tools, we need to change the interface. That would go a long way towards allowing people, and I very much relate to Ambassador Fried's comments before, it won't cure everybody. There are gonna be people who are gonna ignore it, but it will allow many people in the middle who are not bothering with now because they don't know how, because they don't think about it, will allow them to relate differently to information depending on how it's presented. Is it anonymous? Is it verified? Who is it verified by? Which brands, which informational brands is it tied to and so forth? So I think there's a lot of work for us to do in the human communication, human computer interface area to elevate that. Thank you, Laura. One thing that I was, uh, in answering this question, which I think the, the first panel began to deal with quite a bit too, um, I was surprised that we didn't get into more of a discussion of the way that social media platforms or advertising companies, that they don't want to be called, are incented um, in, in what the algorithm in, in the engagement model looks like there. Because I, I think that underlies, you know, it, yes, there's a browser problem, but in all reality, people are getting their information uh, overwhelmingly off scrolling their Facebook newsfeed. Right, and reporters are looking at Twitter for what story's coming on. And as long as that attention engagement model where fear, emotional responses, um, you know, the, the, the most um, extreme level of dialogue gets incented and 
the level of understanding about the transparency of sources is not apparent, then we're going to be dealing with this at a scale that's um, nearly impossible to counter. I mean, not to be super cyber Cassandra, but you know, th that's the level of, of the problem, right? People are getting their news in a way that is, is outside of the types of gatekeepers that incented good information before. And um, I, I think that when we're thinking about the responses from a foreign actor standpoint, from a foreign interference standpoint and how they play on social media, what have you, exposing that Russia is doing it, what, whatever the story is, that it's coming from the Kremlin or coming from whatever new incarnation of the IRA is out there, what have you, is not particularly effective at countering the effect that this information pollution is having in people's news environment. And unlike, for instance, when we were dealing with the problem of the Chinese military's wholesale intellectual property theft that was happening online, we were able to expose what the Chinese military was doing, taking 15 years of R&D, expose how it worked and where it was coming out of and what the IP addresses were behind it and the nature of the campaign and the fact that our green technology was gone for the last 10 years. Um, and, and that had a huge effect on how the Chinese government played. And we essentially established a norm um, writ large in, in the West um, that it was off limits to steal intellectual property. We're playing with a completely different um, incentive structure when it comes to, to Russia interfering right now. And that's because of the media environment. It's because of the advertising environment from social media platforms. And it's because Russia relies on, this ex on, on their actions being public to have both an effect that shows they're larger than their power on traditional stages would be, and because it works. So th the public exposure and transparency all sound great, and I think they're part of, part of a, a good way to take a bite out of an elephant here, but exposing that this is Russian and Kremlin backed for the bazillionth time is not going to be the panacea here like it was in other cases when we took on foreign adversaries. I'd say, um, I mean, first, thanks for the heads up, because I'm speaking at that conference tomorrow. Uh, so that will be, <laughs> so be helpful. Um, so good. Uh, good to hear. Um, but, I, you know, I think the, uh, I think Laura is absolutely right. I mean, I think the problem is people become numb to the fact that you're saying it's Russia. And if they are intent, and this is what the question I asked Dan, I mean, if they're predisposed to believe it, people are basically drinking their news through straws. And, and I think it's larger than just small little fringe communities. It's a lot of people. And I think that's, that's a danger because then it's harder to have an impact, even with all these transparency and other measures. So, so I'd say two things. One, this is the hardest thing to do, but this is something, and people throw out the France example, which I think is only partially helpful. I think you know, the France example was a little bit of an outlier, frank, frankly, but frankly. <laughs> I think the rule was there before it happened, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, we need to do a lot of long-term education to get people to think critically again. And part of that is things like teaching civics in, in school, which we don't really do anymore. Uh, part of that is making people actually not just trust everything that comes across the Internet, but actually think about it critically and that's 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 a generational change that's not something you do in a year or two years so so that's a hard thing to do frankly the other thing is this question also goes to this issue of attribution when you say we don't believe this is happening uh, it's helpful if you cannot just point it out but if you can show your work to some extent and and there is this myth and this goes both for disinformation and the things we're discussing here that attribution in cyberspace is impossible. I mean, that's almost a meme, you know, that you, you can't attribute conduct, you can't do it. And I'll tell you that the greatest proponents of that myth are the people who were doing the bad actions because I, you know, and this is not just true in the cyber world, it's true in the physical world too. Uh, when the invasion of Ukraine happened, you remember the little green men and we didn't do that. It didn't matter how many videos you had of people speaking Russian and having their patches fall off and it showed they're from a, you know, a particular Russian regiment. It didn't matter. People, they'd say, oh, we didn't do it and you can't prove we did it. Um, same with some of these cyber attacks I mentioned um, where, uh, again, you know, despite the evidence, there was a lot of evidence, uh, they said they didn't do it and they demand 100% attribution and showing all the evidence. Now, I'll say two things, and I was a federal prosecutor for years. The standard there is beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not absolute, you know, absolute certainty. This is one of the reasons why uh, engineers were bad jurors, right? <laughs> <laughs> they wanted absolute certainty. Uh, so, 
you know, there is a sense that, you know, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. You know, you look at motivation, you look at the digital footprints, you look at the money flows, you look at a lot of different things. And countries don't want to be wrong when they make these claims that someone, that another country did this, which they do fairly rarely. You know, if they're wrong, it undercuts their credibility in the future. So you don't need 100% proof. You're not going to release all the evidence you have because some of it's classified and it makes or classified or sensitive. And it might give the roadmap to the adversary so they'll do things to you in the future. My best example of that is the, you know, you mentioned the Sony Pictures attack. One of the big frustrations for me is, you know, we had President Obama's going out and saying it's the North Koreans. The first time you ever have a president do this. And before he did that, everyone was saying, oh, it's the North Koreans, it's the North Koreans. Why hasn't the U.S. come out and said it's the North Koreans? He comes out and says the North Koreans, and then all these pundits, including really you know, people I, I like, came out and said, oh, it's not the North Koreans, because they, didn't, you know, they released a lot of evidence, but they didn't release everything, and that we can't show that it was actually them. I mean, people who are, you know, are real luminaries in this community came out and said that, which was frustrating for me, because we knew it was the North Koreans, and we said it was North Koreans, but you know we're not going to give all the proof. So four years later, five years later, right. about a year ago, a 165-page affidavit came out in a, in a criminal case, uh, which laid out all the evidence. And these same pundits were out and said, oh, I guess it wasn't North Koreans. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is, the attribution is possible. It absolutely is possible. We've done it multiple times. It is not a black box. Yes, it's harder for sophisticated actors who like route their communications through other countries and things, but it's not impossible. And we can show that, and we can do the demonstrations of when they've done these bad things, and we need to hold that out and do a better job. Now, you're not gonna name and shame Russia, you're not gonna name and shame North Korea, but you can, I think, get people to understand why this is important and trust you. And that's true for, for disinformation, too. Yeah, it's not a panacea, but uh, it's it's a form of hardening the target. L let me just add, uh, I completely agree with you, Laura, that the, I the main issue is the, is the social networks, and I, I shouldn't have used the term browser. What I really meant is all the platforms on which you consume and produce information uh, should support easier verification, easier tracing of information, including authoring tools. Mm -hmm. So when you want to post something online, it should be easy for you to do it in a way that other people can verify it's you and what are you relying on and so forth. Yeah, and I, I like your point that it doesn't mean you're taking away anonymity because there is good reasons. This mm -hmm. is a debate we used to have all the time where the law enforcement community say we want to trace everyone. And, the, you know, and then you realize, well, you can't do that because you take away people's ability to speak anonymously, which they often have in the physical world, too, about, you know, personal issues and others. So there are things you need to be, you know, you, you need to be identified for banking and other things. There are things you don't, but making that distinction, as you said, and saying with certain things you can trace it, and mm -hmm. if it's anonymous, then you can take that with a grain of salt and say it's anonymous. Right. And I, I hope that some people will uh, set, uh, will learn to behave, to consume information in a responsible way by, for example, blocking anonymous information or anonymous information with certain uh, sentiment analysis attached to it, as, as Professor Hovey suggested earlier. So people can, you talked about drink from a straw, which is really a, a bad thing. I completely agree with you. This is a source of a lot of, of the problems. But um, you can also use it to advantage if you have a rich informational infrastructure that gives you nuances of what is being discussed, by whom, who's I behind it, who verified it, and so forth. I, I mean, I don't want to be the, the skeptic in the room, but I will be and say, you know, people like salacious things sometimes and they don't block them. Um, you know, people go see car accidents, you know, so I, I wish that were true. I wish people would block it. I, but I think we have a long way to go before we get there. I would agree, but a good analogy here is the World uh, Weekly News, right? We're not going to eliminate uh, tabloids, right? But they have not done the kind of damage that some of these campaigns have done. And we need to think, how do we, how do we uh, coexist with these kind of yellow journalism style things and identify them as such? There's a paper in Science by Sanan Aral that talks about um, rumor spread 
more virally and faster on Twitter yeah. than, than regular news for the Sorry. reasons that you just mentioned. So I had a, your question here, and then I'll come back to you. I know you had a question. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and, and I do want to remind people, when you're speaking, please do use the microphone. Um, I had a sort of two-finger, although I have a lot of other questions. I want to push back a little bit on the panel and get your thoughts on this issue of consequence and escalation. Um, I think the phrase naming and shaming is not useful. The way the Russian government, and the Kremlin specifically, deployed the active measures and the IRA and the GRU in terms of social media had a lot of psychological insight into where the U.S. is and other democracies are. But we can do the same in terms of what matters to Mr. Putin. Uh, and his circle, specifically money, the, the funding that they have, the bank accounts, the, uh, in the first panel, I think Dan was mentioning, um, estates in the south of France, uh, townhouses in London. What is your thought on, in the consequence of exposing even a little bit of that, if we were able to do that, of showing, you know, follow the money, and show where the bank accounts are. This is the most vulnerable part, f I think, for the Kremlin in terms of how the Russian population sees um, the leadership. Uh, and we know around the world that corruption is an issue that really can get people on the street and, and motivated. So is that, if we were to do that, if we had the ability to do that, would we be exposing ourselves to some kind of infrastructure attack that would be asymmetric and really worse in affecting people. I mean, what is, what's the psychology on our side self-deterring from this? I mean, first, um, first of all, it has the advantage of being the truth, right? We're not making up these stories about uh, Russian corruption. It's there. So it's pointing out what the actual holdings and investments are. Uh, second, I absolutely agree. I think that is a leverage point. Uh, there was a Defense Sciences Board report that was done about four years ago. Chris Inglis and others worked on it. And it said you have to tailor the consequences if you're going to actually deter conduct by the, the actor, by the adversary. And certain, different things will make a difference to Putin than they will to North Korea, than they will to others. So, uh, and I think you're right. I think one big uh, vulnerability is that corruption and how they're viewed you know, in Russia and how it's viewed around the world. Um, so yes, we should be doing more of that. Uh, Two things we haven't, you know, we've done some sanctions. We haven't really, I think, gone after these money flows in the way we should. Even the UK does, hasn't. You know, look, they had the Skirpal poisoning, which is a big frickin' deal. Um, and, and I'd say two things about the Skirpal poisoning. One, it shows the, the distinction still between cyber and these physical world attacks, where the cyber is still this boutique area, not the major priority. It took uh, Theresa May a week to say it was Russia. It took two weeks or a week after that to get, um, I forget how many countries together to uh, expel diplomats and do other things. It took not petty as six and a half months and then th nothing really followed from it. So we have to reach that same level. But even there, even there, the UK didn't really go after the, the townhouses in Mayfair or other things there. I mean, they didn't go after their holdings, things that would really make an effect. Now, you ask about escalation. I think there was, I think Jim Clapper had said that we, one of the reasons we didn't do more or waited late is that you know we were afraid that the Russians because we're very vulnerable we're really connected to cyberspace that they would launch some kind of attack. I you know I think we have to get over that. I think we have to worry about escalation. But if we keep worrying about what the response will be, we'll take no action and that just will embolden them to do more. And so there's ways to control escalation, just like in the real world. We have lots of tools to do that. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't we shouldn't go crazy and do something <laughs> that would be really escalatory, like you know shut down a power plant or something, but we, we, there's lots of things we could do on finances and other issues that I think would be a proportional response, and if they respond, we can control for that. I would add Nord Stream 2 and a serious look at it as, uh, as, as the enormous, I think, asymmetric advantage that Europe would have and the U.S. would have in, in countering um, Russia's economic livelihood right now. And I don't think that energy issues come up enough in discussions about how we how we interact with Russia. And um, while exposing, you know, it, um, Medvedev and other people's uh, places in France is a, a nice info war tactic. The reality is, you know, the middle class on up have have benefited in Russia from Putin and others' ability to have access into the European markets to sell gas. 
And I would really look at Germany's role in enabling a lot of that. Um, the other piece, too, when you think about um, things that have gotten under the Kremlin's skin, is, is kind of your question asks here. Go back to the Panama paper exposure. Um, what year was that? 2015? Six. It was 16? The year that nothing happened. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, that was really seen as an information weapon. And, you know, granted, there's, there's no evidence that the U.S. was behind that. But um, look at how much that was seen as a threat to the Kremlin and, and sparked some of the initial exposure of the estates in France, et, et cetera. So, um, you know, look, I, I think it's a matter of really um, giving some of the um, – it, dissident uh, voices and, 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 and a real tracking of what Russian um, voices that aren't making making the media are looking at and where those pain points are. And I think those will lead us to an understanding of what's going to be effective to counter the Kremlin. Okay. Um, can I come back to you? I think you, um, the lady, you had a question. No, that is you? Yeah. No, no, you didn't. Okay. <laughs> thought you had a question earlier. We'll make question. one. <laughs> up, up front, up front. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yep, got it. Yes. Oh, no, no, I thought go. you said up front. No, go, Any, go here okay. and then you come here. So I'm Karin Shui with the Estonian American National Council, and I just wanted to ask about the Tallinn Manual and Tallinn Manual 2.0 and if they're relevant to this discussion at all or have they faded into obscurity or, you know, what's your perspective on the helpfulness of those pieces of work? So you want to start? No. Okay. And so for, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Talon Manual and Talon Manual 2 were an attempt by a number of international lawyers with the participation but not, you know, blessing of a, lot, a number of countries too. Uh, to come up with how international law applies to cyberspace. Uh, and there's a lot of really good things in there, frankly, I think, but it's not blessed by countries. You know, this is a group of experts. And some of the stuff I think is, is really good. Some of it I think is kind of questionable, but that's fine. That's what academic works like this do. But I would say this. Um, the number one conclusion that they make, which has also now been agreed to by a number of countries, including Russia, China, the US, and others, is that international law actually does apply to cyberspace. There was this doubt at one point that it didn't. You know, I think the distinction now is the US and others feel that we don't need new international laws. You have to apply the ones you have. Uh, because if you have differing laws, that creates, that creates um, instability in, in itself. Uh, but it tries to deal with things like how do you respond to a cyber incident below the threshold of force? What is the use of force, et cetera? Lots of thorny legal questions. There's not complete agreement on it. But I think it was a really good uh, attempt to lay that out, and it's one of the touchstones I think people use. Now, what's happening now in a number of different fora, in the UN, there's two, two separate things, something called the UN Group of Governmental Experts, which this is the third one. The first one agreed international law applied. The second one came up with some norms. The third one is starting now. And then something called the Open-Ended Working Group, which is a larger number of countries that was a Russian resolution that was just meeting in New York. And they're both looking at some of these questions. And there, there, are, there are some challenges, uh, like China and Russia don't want to go into how international humanitarian law works, which is the law of armed conflict. This is like when you have a conflict, proportionality, distinction, things like that, uh, where other countries do. But I think the, the short-term workaround for that may be the countries are beginning to express their own views on how international law applies. And I think that's the first step, right? So. Uh, one thing written into this group of governmental experts resolution in the UN was that voluntarily come, countries should come forth and say, here's how we think it applies to cyberspace. And a number of countries have started to do that. And so we're, this is a long-term thing, right? We're not going to get there uh, overnight, but I think more countries are doing that. The talent manual helps inform that, so it's not shelfware, but I think it's a helpful uh, marker along the path. I don't know. Uh, thank you. I'm Natalie Marischal with the Ranking Digital Rights Project at New America. Uh, I'd like to pick up on Laura Galante's comment about uh, social media companies being more properly termed advertising companies and how this, this incents companies to, uh, to behave in certain ways. Um, so I think I think that that comment speaks to the importance of uh, the tech company structure, their business model, uh, again the incentives that they respond to, um, and so how do you see? And my my organization is focused on um, nudging companies to move in a more human rights and democracy respecting uh, direction um, with 
with respect to, to, to these themes. So I'm curious how you and, and perhaps others on the panel see uh, the role of tools like privacy regulation and antitrust in reshaping the tech sector, and specifically the American tech sector, in ways that bolster democracy rather than undermine it. Um, so I feel like the, the privacy debate is actually distinct from um, a, a lot of the questions around what the social media advertising companies are incenting. And I actually think it's a fallacy that we've fallen into a lot over the last few years that, oh, if we just figured out how, how people could own their data or how they could consent to certain data use, then we would you know, be OK in how we use these, these platforms. And, and I think that's false. So um, as much as good privacy efforts should be tackled, and I think GDPR is an interesting way of, of starting that conversation in a regulatory format, um, you know, privacy I see as a um, sort of related but distinct problem here than, than what we're dealing with more tactically on, on, let's just be clear, it's mostly Facebook, right? D Twitter to some degree, but, but Facebook in particular. And I think that efforts, um, and I would point to what the Center for Humane Technology has been doing over the last few years. I think um, they've really been putting in good thought and are, are there in San Francisco and kind of bridging and working with social media in addition to being a real outside critique. Um, and, and what they're essentially, and, and other Others are looking at is how do you um, either incent transparency about how these algorithms um, are preferencing what they are preferencing, and then how do you expose what that transparency looks like? It's essentially how are you an editor 2.0, Facebook, right? Though you don't want to be in an editing or a content role, your algorithm is by default creating what goes into to someone's sight line for their media environment, right? Um, so how how did those um, exposure and accountability efforts around algorithms and content preferences uh, start to come out, I think is, is a really natural next step for how we get some accountability on the game. So perhaps a, a, a slightly different perspective on this. Um, so f from a user standpoint, one could ask the question um, that the algorithms that are curating the content that an individual reads on Facebook or any kind of social media is actually reducing search costs for the user and is actually delivering content that the user wants to obtain access to. Um, social media also preserves the individual's right of association. I decide who I want to connect to and that's all for the good. I think the, the, tr the problem arises when you have on the one hand the user's free will which we'd like to support to have the capacity to decide who they want to connect to and the kind of content they want to uh, read. Uh, but then you also have this filter bubble kind of problem that arises from the fact that the algorithms that um, you know, further send you content that's tied in uh, with not only what you read but what your friends read and this then becomes a, um, uh, an issue where you have this concentration of content that don't, doesn't allow you uh, to get perhaps, so from a social welfare perspective, um, there's a tension with the individual um, utility maximizing perspective, right? So the question is where do you sort of land? So it's not, a, I think it's not as straightforward as saying um, that, you know, it's advertising that's the problem. I think it's, the, somebody has to pay for this infrastructure and it has to be paid for in some, some manner. I think it's this question of how do we best uh, navigate this uh, trade-off between individual utility maximizing behavior and social welfare maximizing behavior. I think that's sort of the the trade-off, and I I think you can land in different places. Where Laura talk, what Laura said may well be one way to sort of um, uh, decide you want to sort of land in this place where you sort of are going to sort of make some decisions, perhaps about uh, the kind of content that you're going to see. Uh, maybe that's something that you could say that the algorithms have to not just rely on content related to what you are seeing and what your friends are saying, but in addition to that, we will send you additional content, 20% of the content or something like that, over and above, and then that in turn gets you to see uh, the ads then are also not so specific. But uh, so I think it's a, it's a more complicated, more nuanced issue. Uh, I think it goes to the, uh, that goes to this issue of how do you trade off these two goals? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm.
<clears throat> Hi, I, I came in a few minutes late, so not my name tent, but I'm Alina Polyakova, I'm at the Brookings Institution. I want to pick up on this conversation that you're just having about uh, algorithmic transparency and content delivery mechanisms. And I'm reminded of a statistic actually from the Center of Human Technology that you mentioned, Laura. And I, I can't say I know exactly how they got this statistic, um, but uh, something in, a, in the nature of like 80% of the hours, billions of hours watched on YouTube are delivered by the algorithm and not chosen through a user query. Um, and I think that's quite shocking uh, when you consider the number of hours uh, per day uh, that YouTube gets eyeballs on. And I think that gets to the question of algorithm transparency in a really profound way when it comes to user choice. But I think often when you approach the companies uh, with this question, um, their response is that you know, they have to protect trade secrets, our intellectual property rights. But I think there's a spectrum of transparency, right? I think it's not that you have transparency or you don't, right? And I think the, the issue that we need to be talking about, in my view, and I think the companies are open to this conversation, um, is defining what that means when it comes to transparency around personal data collection, micro-targeting, uh, transparency around sharing data with researchers, for example, this is a huge issue um, that, I don't know if there's anybody here from Social Science One, uh, but the entire experience of Facebook um, trying to set up some sort of uh, sharing, information sharing mechanisms with the research community it just has been a complete like I think it's a, bit, a, bit, a complete disaster, right? Um, so I think these are the kinds of conversations that seem to be on the table now where we can start to find some middle ground and what do we actually mean by transparency from the perspective of the user, perspective of governments, the perspective of the research community and the perspective of industry and where can we actually find ways uh, to establish some sort of processes to build trust and to build uh, information sharing into, into the coordination system between the private sector and these other sectors I mentioned. So I would be just keen for any thoughts on that. How do we do that better? Um, two, just one, co one comment and then a, a broader remark. With, with regard to YouTube, uh, I think the, 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 the driver of that is the engagement model. Uh, which is that you know it's it's queued up so you watch a video and the next one lines up and that's what results in um, and I, I think it's tied to the number of hours of engagement and the the and your point there is well taken um, now to your uh, other point about you know how do we uh, involve information sharing um, you're absolutely right that the the Facebook initiative has been uh, um, has, has not been uh, not been it's been a disaster. I think I was looking for a better word, but I couldn't find it. Uh, so, but but I, I think the the thing that we've been thinking about, right, it, it, to a broader question of how do we support public and private sector uh, information sharing? I'm not speaking specifically of Facebook here. No, I'm thinking of the the broader question of how do you take private information and public information and connect the two. Um, so th there was a, a National Academies report that a colleague of mine, uh, Tom Mitchell, um, um, uh, co-authored with Eric Brynolfsson from MIT. And one of their points was that there's a lot of information, for instance, LinkedIn, Monster.com, Burning Glass, et cetera, and then BLS kind of data, just to give you an example, something totally different from the Facebook kind of context that we've been talking about. Uh, but at the same time, there's not that much uh, that's enabled um, by connecting the dots between public and private data sources because of privacy kinds of concerns. So one of the thoughts that we've been having is, uh, could there be a breakthrough in privacy, um, uh, privacy sensitive technology that would allow for uh, computing that would allow for inferences to be drawn while still protecting privacy? In other words, the policy debate could be changed by shifting the curve, if you will, um, by your, on, if you think of the y-axis as the quality of inferences you could draw and the x-axis as some measure of privacy protection you could afford, then can you pro afford greater levels of privacy protection while still increasing the quality of uh, inferences made through a privacy sensitive computation? So this is a, an example of going the other way where you're saying technology innovation could change the policy debate. Um, and it's not directly in response to your Facebook question, but to your broader question of how could you have 
um, private and public and other sectors sharing information. That's something that's an ongoing uh, discussion we're having at Carnegie Mellon. You know, I would be curious um, if there's anyone in the room who has um, good historical knowledge on what the FCC went through with television advertising, early on in truth and advertising. And, um, you know, you just, you just think about some of the efforts that we arrived on, right? Like kids programming can't have a certain number of advertising for products or whatever it is on, on kids' channels. Um, and you can't play certain types of movies in, 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 while kids are awake or whatever these kind of rules are um, that developed around content in the FCC. I, I don't know if there's parallels there, but, you know, as, as Alina's bringing up here, autoplay and the number of, of minutes spent where people are just sucked into a, a non-choice, essentially, in a lot of these cases, you, you just wonder how you start to balance out some of the public good aspect of this um, through mechanisms that we have in, in other spheres. So not to just posit a question back to you, but th that's, th I, I, I wonder if there are other analogies that we can look to um, in this space that, that kind of fit that advertising communication uh, model and incentive structure that we've dealt with in other areas before. So uh, any other qu comments, Ronnie? Did you want to comment on this? Um, just to add, I really like your framing of the uh, individual utility maximization and liberty versus the social welfare. And of course, we're dealing with it in other areas. And uh, in recent years, we're dealing with the nudge uh, theory and with the whole uh, sort of uh, uh, behavioral economics uh, approach. And, and I think that's what you were tying into. You're talking mm -hmm. about choice. Yeah. We're really talking about choice so architectures. Right, mm -hmm. So right. how do you frame the choice in the way that yeah. help people do what they might think is ultimately the right thing for them without taking away the freedom of choice? Uh, we have not, I don't have solutions, but we have not thought enough about it. The, the, the entire uh, online experiences evolve without any attention to that question at all. Uh, it was it evolved only to maximize you know revenues and um, and, and engagement, uh, yeah. engagement. Indeed, that's, that, that's a great point, um, Ronnie. And also, um, you know, as a dean, I'm allowed to brag once during a, a session. <laughs> uh, so behavioral economics is also a great strength at Carnegie Mellon. So, uh, uh, so I, we are getting close to the end of our panel. I just want to make sure that we give you know like we did in the last round collect a set of questions and then uh, answer them. So maybe it's time for, they call it rapid fire. So if you could sort of ask your questions. Yes, Ellen. Um, sorry, I actually just had a two finger and, and that okay, was a all right. question. I'm sorry, we only <laughs> answered one. We'll go with the second one. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> no, I just, I just uh, uh, a two finger meaning a follow up, which yeah, is the, like indeed. DC parlance. Anyways, um, just to the FCC Sarah point. Sarah has been schooling me to those things. Ah, very good, yeah, very yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the FCC point that Laura made, um, one of my colleagues at Brookings is uh, Tom Wheeler, who's the former chairman of the FCC, and we had this conversation with him about Section 230, which of course is the main reason why the FCC has no mandate or jurisdiction over the companies, right? And there doesn't seem to be a plan to replace Section 230 or to revise Section 230, and until that happens, I think all of these parallels, that they're obviously there, Laura. Um, between uh, telecom industry and perhaps other industries as well, um, the FCC cannot touch any of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a result, we're in this kind of ad hoc model where like the FTC has you know, jurisdiction over some elements, um, the SEC has jurisdiction, jurisdiction over some elements of the kind of digital environment, uh, but we don't, we don't have any sort of comprehensive uh, regulatory thinking because of like two lines in, in that code from the mid 90s. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, just to, because I study political communication, I would say that cable television challenged the FCC's ability to regulate, the internet destroyed it. So let's just to go there. I, I just want to throw out a fun and provocative question um, where I think all of this discussion has been really good, really nuanced, but it's like the opiate crisis, right? If you're facing an industry that is determined to ignore all evidence that this is destroying human health and you're essentially robbing humans of their ability to navigate uh, addiction, uh, which is what it did. Uh, and, and not to say that, you know, either the patients or the doctors or the companies are necessarily evil, but the system itself perpetuated evil. Isn't that in a way a metaphor for social media companies? Okay. All right. 
other, uh, we'll try and take them all together. Let me just uh, yeah. comment on that. As, as you probably <laughs> know, <laughs> you we've been uh, at uh, great loss to handle the yeah. opioid crisis and the players there until some financial pressure was brought to bear, right? So this goes back to your previous comment that sometimes the financial, legal financial pressure is what, um, what makes people stop and listen. And great journalism about it. That, that is yeah. Yeah. Ed, did you have a question? I, forgive me my, my naivete. I sit and listen. I'm fascinated by this discussion. I'm learning so much, and I keep hearing different things from different people, and they don't, for me, connect up. And I'm wondering why. Roni says, we can build better browsers. Chris says, the lawyers got all upset, and they said, nothing's happening, so we're going to make these Tallinn documents one and two, and we'll do it ourselves. Laura says, look at the insurance companies. They're mostly making rules about how we incentivize and disincentivize through what, how much we're going to charge for insurance. You can name many, many other instances like this. And I'm, I'm wondering, again, forgive my, my naivete, why are there no fora like this, discussion groups, where in representatives from these different communities and from government come and sit down and the press talk to one another and say, you technologist, if you can build this, then I, insurance person, can do this with this, and you, company, can do da-da-da-da, so that we it doesn't have to be done once or twice or three times. I come from the tech world where Google and Facebook and these people, they didn't sit down and say, well, what are, they said, let's disrupt, let's make this thing, and five years later, you have this big giant company. We, we, it seems to me s strange, unusual, or maybe I just don't know enough that there aren't any more cross-side cross connections and discussions. You have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on uh, the financial uh, incentives and wonder what kind of role advertisers can play in, in both the social media pollution space and maybe the cybersecurity hygiene space that, um, say, a Sony attack, if you're buying ad space on a, on a show, you obviously don't want that show to be hacked and leaked, right? And same way, if you're advertising on social media, you want real eyes on it rather than bots and inauthentic accounts. So I just wonder if there's an effective way to bring them into the conversation as a financial lever. Okay. Yeah. I, I think we're, I've been given the one minute warning, which means <laughs> you're done. Um, so let, let me just sort of summarize on, on two topics. This has been a fascinating conversation. I think I want to thank you all for your questions. But um, this idea of the, the point that Ed made and Robert made, this idea of the crosswalk between technology and policy to where things actually happen, not just talk, but things actually happen. Um, is there the opportunity to create a test bed, uh, a means of actually trying these different um, tech innovations to address policy goals, or vice versa, where tech innovations change the policy discussion, going, going both ways? Um, is that something that can be supported and funded? We have a number of foundation folks here. Uh, perhaps that's something that, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Uh, but I just want to request my colleagues to have a concluding remark, and then we can have more conversation uh, during the break. Uh, let's start with Ronnie. Um, just, just reacting to Ed's uh, last comment, uh, my understanding from, uh, uh, from Ambassador Mendelssohn is that uh, these kind of meetings are, um, I wouldn't say rare, but not as common as they should be. Uh, but this one is a good start for something like that. So um, I think putting it on the table is one thing, but don't underestimate how much talking has to happen before things <laughs> happen. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're on our way there, but uh, good point. All right. Um, Chris and I were kind of laughing as we were walking over of how many disinformation conferences have you been invited to in the last three years, right? Um, and and Ed's, Ed's question sort of uh, makes a point of that. You know, we've been, uh, almost admiring or um, you know, looking at this problem for, for years now. And though for a lot of people in this room, it probably feels like we've been, we've been thinking about this for a decade or more in a lot of cases. And, and you know, it's mutated with the way that media has changed and tech has changed, but so many of these underlying issues are still there. Um, I think the real challenge is how do, you, how do you get the right people who can start to respond to different pieces of this, know what's long term and what's short term, and you know, kudos to this group to getting together, but it, the next step is, is, the, is the most important here. So. Thanks. Chris, finally. So I'd say two things that they're waving the stop sign in the background. One, yeah. one, is, um, one, one is we need to disaggregate the problem a little bit. 
I mean, the point of this panel was not to talk so much about disinformation. We ended up talking about disinformation. So these are different things and there are different solutions. So I think we need to think about how we can address these issues somewhat more granularly. OK, that's one. Two, you know, Sarah already said there's like a thousand or Laura's already said there's like a thousand of these uh, different meetings, which is good. But we need to really make progress. And so it's good we're having these meetings. I've been to a bunch. You've been to a bunch. I think we've all been to a bunch uh, that try to bring these different communities together. Uh, but we need to actually have some actions out of them. And you don't have to solve everything. Just pick one or two things and work on that. Other people can work on other things. You don't have to have the one ring that rules them all. You can just look at the things you want to solve. So my advice is pick one or two things and, and start having at it. So we began with Sony Pictures. We're ending with Lord of the Rings. So thank you again very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Sure. Thank you. That was great.